Okay, uh, so I think we can begin. Uh, it's, a, it's, a true, it's a true pleasure to, to welcome and uh, to have in today's session, uh, Professor Samuel Saitlin. Um, I, will have, I will say some, some words about him uh, in a minute, but uh, this, this conversation in a way uh, puts an end or comes at the closure of a, of a little seminar that we have had in the last nine weeks or so at the uh, Institute of uh, Critical Studies in Mexico uh, on Carl Schmitt and legal, and legal theory or legal philosophy. And, and uh, of course, needless to say, that uh, Professor Saitling's work has been uh, very important for us and for, for everyone involved in the, in the mini seminar. Um, for those who, who don't know uh, Professor Saitling, he is a fellow researcher at uh, the Corpus Christi College at the University of Cambridge. And um, he, he works on, contempt I think, early modern or modern political philosophy at large, um, but has done important work on the um, on, on the philosophy of Francis Bacon, um, Thomas Hobbes, and and most recently, I think, and, and important for the purpose of this uh, of this seminar, uh, it has been his his important critical uh, editions and translation of uh, Carl Schmitt's uh, works. I think a few years ago, um, uh, Professor Saitlin translated uh, a collection, an important collection of Carl Schmitt's essays under the title uh, "The Tyranny of Values" and other essays that was published in uh, Tilos Press. Uh, also, a wonderful translation of "Land and Sea," the the the, the little um, essay that Schmitt, Schmitt wrote uh, in the second part of his life. Uh, most recently, uh, we have his book that in a way goes back to the early Schmidt, uh, which will be the object of, of conversation today. It's published by Cambridge University Press. Um, it was a little blur here, but it's Carl Schmidt's early legal theoretical writings. Um, well, it's, like I said, it's, um, it's a great honor to have Professor Seitling here to, to in a way close the, the, the conversation on Carl Schmidt's philosophy. And I asked Sam to, to in a way, um, tease out or uh, give us a little introduction about the book, how it came into being, uh, a little bit of the historical context uh, of the book. And later on, uh, well, we can, we can uh, have some, some discussions and questions based on, on what Professor Saitling will tell us and, and other aspects I'm sure that he will be willing to discuss around Carl Schmitt's work. Uh, so uh, having said that, uh, I'll give you the word, Sam, and also I, I, I thank Rodrigo and, and everyone involved in the Institute for, for the coordination. So, yeah, um, thank you. Thank you greatly, um, Professor uh, Gerardo Munoz uh, and to the Institute of Critical Studies for the great chance uh, to talk with you today about Carl Schmitt's political thought. We might begin by asking, why, why do we study Carl Schmitt uh, as a figure in the history of 20th century political thought. Schmidt, born on 11 July, 1888, and dying on 7 April, 1985, so perhaps into the lifetimes of some of us uh, here in the room today, uh, both lived and wrote across the first nine decades of the 20th century. He wrote almost 50 self-standing books or pamphlets between 1910, close to um, the works uh, we're looking at today, and 1979, and more than 280 journal articles in review, 280. Uh, in English language scholarship, Schmidt is most noted for his writings uh, in the Weimar period, so after the texts we're looking at today, whereas in Germany and in German thought, Schmidt is notorious above all for his entanglements as head of the Union of National Socialistic German Jurists from 1933 to 1936, and as Prussian State Council, Preußischer Staatsrat, uh, from 1933 to 1945. Schmidt's writings uh, in the Weimar era are marked first by distinguishing between liberal institutions such as representation, parliamentary governance and judicial review, and democratic institutions, acclamation, directly visual and public approbation. Democratic decision-making in Schmidt's view has the potential to override uh, individual rights, while representative government and judicial review and even private ballots in Schmidt's view are liberal institutions aimed at protecting rights and curbing majority rule. 
It is important to understanding Schmidt that one of his chief opponents, the Austrian jurist and legal philosopher Hans Kelsen, uh, would insist on the unity of democracy and liberalism when both liberalism and democracy are rightly understood in Kelsen's view. Well, Schmidt insists that liberalism and democracy are at the very least in a relation of uncomfortable tension. Schmidt puts forth these arguments perhaps most sharply uh, in his constitutional theory, um, his writings on referenda, as well as perhaps most strikingly his uh, intellectual historical situation of contemporary parliamentarism translated into English as the crisis of parliamentary democracy. Second, Schmidt's writings are both in and beyond, both in and beyond the, the Weimar era, are marked by a rhetorical strategy of theologization, let's say. In a sense here, Schmidt is inverting Nietzsche. Nietzsche claims um, both in Die Freudische Wissenschaft, the gay science, um, in the voice of Der Tote Mensch, the madman, and in the voice of Zarathustra in the prologue or Vorrede to Zarathustra, it's claimed famously or infamously that God is dead. Uh, if God for Nietzsche is nullified or a nullity, then if Nietzsche feels that he can show the theistic or Christian origins of say socialism or a preference for equality, Nietzsche feels that he can theologize apparently secular movements for egalitarianism or for socialism or other things of which he disapproves. If Nietzsche feels that he can theologize those things, then Nietzsche feels that he will have tethered them to the untenable, tethered them to a God that is dead. Schmidt's rhetorical strategy is in effect to deploy this Nietzschean strategy against itself, showing that apparently secular concepts and secular movements, including atheism itself, have both theological roots and theological analogs. And it's seemingly modern or secular concepts like the state or sovereignty are secularized theological notions, uh, but also that seemingly secular thinkers like for example, Hobbes or Kant or Hegel, or even Francis Bacon, whom Gerardo uh, just aptly mentioned, are really masked theologians advocating an imminent form of confessional politics. This move is highlighted in Schmidt's political theology of 1922, but it is present in his earliest writings in the Wilhelmine Empire, which uh, Gerardo Minos uh, just, just showed us, um, the value of the state and the significance of the individual from 1914, uh, from these early works all the way to Schmidt's last books, Political Theology II in 1970 and The Tyranny of Values in both 1960 and 1979. Above all, Schmidt is keen to show that apparently secular thinkers from Hobbes to Habermas are really immanentized Protestant theologians unable to escape their confessional heredity. A variant of this argument is deployed by Schmidt against Jewish writers publicly and frighteningly from 1933 to 1945, but also privately in his diaries and letters from 1910 until the end of his life. So that's the kind of second reason. It's this kind of strategy of theolo the theologization uh, is kind of a second reason for why we read Schmidt, let's say. A third reason, uh, given in Schmidt's concept of the political, published as an article in 1927, as a book chapter in 1928, and as a self-standing book or pamphlet in 1932, in the concept of the political, Schmidt opens his tract uh, with the declaration that the concept of the state presupposes the concept of the political. The ground of that presupposition is Schmidt's definition of the state, which he doesn't give uh, in the text. The state, uh, for Schmidt, is the political unity of a people. And that's true both in constitutional theory and in Schmidt's concept of the political. An understanding of the state, of the political unity of a people, presupposes an understanding of the political or an understanding of what politics is. Schmidt gives an answer to the question of what politics is, where Hannah Arendt, say, writing at least in part against Schmidt, might stress that politics is to be understood as acting in concert within the realm of appearance, Schmidt stresses that politics might, in the first instance, be understood as a domain, a domain. Schmidt understands politics as the domain in which the fundamental distinction is that between friends and enemies. On this view, each domain, whether economics, aesthetics, or morality, is divided into a kind of root binary. For economics, the core distinction is that between profitable and unprofitable, 
For aesthetics, the distinction is that between the beautiful and the ugly. For morality, the core distinction is between good and bad, or in Schmidt's view, between good and evil. What makes the political domain distinctive is that both agreements and disagreements, and above all, desiderative conflicts in each of the other domains can, if driven to the heights of intensity, which for Schmidt are also the heights of violence, those desiderative conflicts can become political. When economic competition intensifies into a trade war for Schmidt, there is politics. When moral disagreement intensifies into conflict, there is politics. When aesthetic agreement or disagreement intensifies into dueling or feud, there is politics. Finally, a word must be said linking Schmidt the stylist, uh, the literary writer, to Schmidt's political thought. Brevity is a Schmidtian virtue, perhaps not so much on display in Schmidt's Habitation. So when he's writing for uh, the bureaucracy, when he's writing to pass uh, a dissertation, he's not maybe being so brief, but in general, uh, brevity is a Schmidtian virtue. Whatever else his writings are, Carl Schmidt's most famous texts, from the concept of the political to political theology to Roman Catholicism and political form, these texts are short. Within a Schmidtian lens, the short and the striking, like decisions themselves, are preferred to the prolix, the boring, and the indecisive. In this regard, Schmidt's dialogues are no exception. Uh, Schmidt's dialogue on power and access to the holder of power vies with his tyranny of values as the shortest pamphlet book in the oeuvre of a thinker who prefers the short to the long and the aphoristic to the prolix. So I'll, I'll stop there for a moment, but I, I, we, can, we can expand on, on the text in question, but I just wanted to kind of lay out four reasons for why we still study Schmidt today. Um, the two texts collected um, in the book that um, Gerardo uh, so kindly was showing to you, those are two texts that were published first in 1912 and 1914 respectively. Amazingly, two books that Schmidt wrote in effect before he had turned 25, uh, which is pretty amazing. I mean, I wish I had written something um, that good uh, before I turned 25. And the, the latter text, the value, the value of the state, the significance of the individual, that's Schmidt's second um, qualifying uh, book, as it were. The first book, um, Guilt and Types of Guilt, was his doctoral dissertation published in 1910. His Habilitation, which is this second book in, the, in that um, edition, The Value of the State and Significance of the Individual is the Habilitationsschrift, which then qualifies Schmidt to teach in universities. Um, he becomes a private teacher, a, a Privatdozent at the University of Strasbourg. Um, and it's really, it, it, while it's dated to 1914, the book is actually out in press by Christmas of 13. So he, you know, he's published, he's only 25 years old when it, when it appears in print. Um, so it's kind of an amazing thing. And the book before is actually published two, two years prior, uh, Statute, Law, and Judgment, um, which in effect lays out Schmidt's view of what is a correct judgment. That's the kind of question the opening thought is published between his first book on guilt and this um, other major, major treatise on state theory, both all of which appear prior to the outset and the outbreak of the First World War. The first book in, in the series is about what makes a correct judgment. Schmidt comes to the view that a judgment is correct, a legal judgment or a legal decision is correct if any other lawyer or any other jurist or judge would decide the same case in precisely the same way. That is laid out in the fourth chapter of that book. But the implication of that view is that there's a background of shared culture or shared knowledge, um, shared practice, but also in some sense homogeneity, homogeneity of thought, but also homogeneity of practice, that everyone, every rightly educated or properly educated judge, jurist, or lawyer would decide the relevant case in the same way. But if that homogeneity is lacking, then the basis for objective judgment, but also the basis for right judgment falls away. And then I think one can see um, the kind of futural tendency of that, and perhaps there's some you know, minimal way in which that might be true. For example, you know, in, in the United States or in Britain, if you have people disagreeing, you know, is, does, green, uh, does green mean go or stop, let's say? Um, if you have people saying, you know, oh, green means stop, right? Well, you, you're going to have a traffic problem, 
right? And um, that would that would be a kind of Schmidtian view of that. And, and it's 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 arbitrary, um, but it's also necessary to decide the question of whether of what the of what the stoplight colors mean, and that um, social disagreement at that level of you know on, on that question um, is dangerous. Um, and so there so there have to be as it were prior decisions about. Um, semantics. I'll maybe I'll stop there. I'll start, I'll start start taking questions. I'm sure I've already spoken too long, um, but I'm also I'm thrilled to be speaking with you. I'm thrilled by uh, this invitation both to speak at the Institute of Critical Studies and from Professor Munoz, uh, whose work I've long admired. Right. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, that, that was a wonderful introduction to to get us started. And um, I forgot to mention that since a lot of um, Spanish speakers uh, are here with us. Uh, we can also take questions in Spanish and we can we can facilitate the English uh, translation if needed. Um, uh, I have myself a couple of questions for you, um, but but I think we have a question here that is sent by by uh, Jose Luis Evaristo. Jose Luis, no sé si quieres hacer la pregunta o, o también la puedo leer yo, como quieras. Oh, he's having so, a problem. I think. So, um, so I can I can start answering his question. So I'll, so he he says, do you consider um, that Schmidt's way of criticism uh, uh, of a way of conceiving and applying law as statutory practice is a criticism of a certain type of positivism? I, I think it is. I think it is. So I think it implies a background condition that actually um, the law itself doesn't decide the question, right? So in other words, statutory text is insufficient. Um, and even that, that there can be an ambiguities. And, that's, and in fact, the other, the alternate positions that are not um, you know, practice centered, and also you could say um, community, you know, the kind of community centered in, in the sense of being practice centered, um, Schmidt is dismissing those alternatives and positive, positivism comes up as one of them. So I think I mean, so if you wanna go quick, first again, I'm open to, I can also expand on this. And also you can say, if you, if you are able to activate, um, I see in the, in the text, you're not able to activate, but if you are to activate, I'm happy to go. So the first part of your question, I'd give a yes to that. Um, and I think also that, that the Schmidtian text would be um, consistent with that. The second part of your question is what kind of positivism was Schmidt thinking about? And so I guess you, the second question actually implies that uh, my answer to your first question is your answer to your first question. So I, I think we have actually a background condition of agreement, and you can also write in the, in the chat if you think we disagree about that. Um, so in other words, what kind of positive? Well, I think Kelsenian positivism would be would be one, um, but also neo-Kantian legal positivism more broadly would be um, the variant, you know, variants of that position of which Kelsen is one would be um, things that Schmidt is thinking about. The third part of your question, this criticism serves to conceive the right of judges as social practice. I think that's also right. Um, do you think this is an approach to a realistic position of law? So I, I'm not sure that Schmidt would, Schmidt would contest maybe the notion of what, of what is real, right? So I mean, so that, that would be the, maybe the kind of background thought there. But I do think if, if you take, think, take the issue of the tra traffic lights, and, we, we, I think we, and Schmidt uses traffic examples. He actually uses, his example is the evasion rules for carts. Uh, in because uh, that's an urteil. So you know, do do, do carts ev evade to the left or they evade to the right? Right. It's purely arbitrary. But if everyone doesn't agree on that, you're going to have traffic collisions. It's going to be harmful to human life. Let's say. But you could use other traffic examples, and I think actually traffic examples like traffic lights, evasion rules for carts. So it's actually it's a pre-automotive text, which is an amazing thing. I um, mean, you know, the Schmidt saw such massive technological development in the course of his lifetime, coming from the world of the ox-drawn cart uh, and ending his life, you know, at, almost at the end of the Soviet Union, uh, is, is incredible um, technological transformation. But he's still using examples from ox, you know, from carts, not from, not even from cars, are, are the legal examples that he's using in these early legal texts. Um, so, but, but, and this question of realism, I think Schmidt would contest what is real, right? Um, and partially what is real is, is what we believe to be real and what, what, a, what a practice, but also what a community believes to be real um, to some extent defines the real. So I think the real will be contested by Schmidt, but there also is some sense in which if you don't come to some agreement about traffic rules, at least from a Schmidtian perspective, you're going to have 
collisions of carts or cars, um, and it would it will really be a danger to life. Um, so is, there is some sense in which, in which the it, it can seem to us, oh, it's crazy, you know, homogeneity and so forth. But we do actually agree that green means go and red means stop. And except for in Great Britain, where I teach, um, everyone else agrees um, that, you know, people drive on, uh, um, you know, a certain side of the road and, uh, you know, on the other side of the road, you don't drive. Um, but in, in Great Britain, they, they do it the other way around. But they agree. They agree. They, they, everything is reversed and inverted, um, but it's a reverse and inverted the other way. Um, so there's there's agreement even even in the disagreement, let's say. The last point is that the possibility of a single correct answer is not a flirtation with a certain type of positivism. And so I guess that, that that's kind of maybe flipping Schmidt's view on itself. I, and so you, you could say, in some sense, maybe, right, you could say that it is a flirtation with that, but it also depends, it depends on what people really think, right? And, and, and in this sense, I think even um, you could say the monarchic, uh, Schmidt of the Kaiserreich, there is a kind of democratic sensibility to this, which is, and, and also something, some sense of unanimity, dem, de, democratic, and it really matters what people actually think about the question. Um, and so Schmidt wouldn't, you know, isn't necessarily a, a fan of, uh, you know, private voting or, or things, you know, we might associate with de democracy, but there's also a sense in which um, he does actually, it does matter for his view, I think, in every period, um, what the people as a whole, but also, um, yeah, it, it, what, they, what they think. Um, I don't know if I've, if I've spoken to the different aspects of your question, but I'm also open to that uh, or other questions. Um, well, as, as perhaps as we wait for another for another question or comment or reaction, um, I also wanted to pick up and say something, or or perhaps ask you something re in relation to 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 his conception of. Uh, of the practice of jurisprudence or or uh, the actual practice of of the of the judge right which comes near positivism um but then it has this aspect where uh it respects sort of the continuity or almost as if it was and correct me if i'm wrong a, a sort of um a minimalist um, practice of common law right of attending to the precedent of uh even I don't know if you would agree, but this uh, the the thesis, right, or the assumption of the uh, of the judge deciding as another judge would decide, uh, and sending a signal to the community of um, of courts has a sort of principle of internal principle of recognition there, right? Yeah. Uh, of course, it's not articulated in the same way that Hart's uh, conception is, uh, but he has that. Which, which I, I guess my 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 question is. Um, how, how for you um, does Schmidt comes in relation to his critique of positivism? Because for a lot of critics of Schmidt, it seems that he appears as a um, as an anti-positivist, right? Enemy of Kelsen, but it seems that the the relation is more complex, right? And especially if one considers right the the traditional or historical enemy of positivism, we have talked about it in in recent times, natural law. Um, Schmidt there is very different from the Catholic natural law tradition, um, except when we get to, to the work of John Finney. But before that, uh, Schmidt is not endorsing a sort of doctrinal conception of, uh, of Catholic authority. On the contrary, right, uh, as, as, you, as you are translating the, in the essay, in, in the book of the value of the state and the individual, uh, Schmidt in a way sort of repeats the maestro's conception of uh, of the Pope uh, as based on authority, the infallibility uh, principle, and not necessarily at the level of doctrines or, or substantive conception of the good. It seems to me that that's, I don't know if you would agree, that's the question. It seems to me that that's a continuity that starts very early here and it would go up into uh, uh, the tyranny of values that that you know and you have written so well about. Yeah, no, that's that's great. So I would I'd follow on that, and so take the last part first. I do think that that the continuity with Demestre is thor thoroughgoing. Um, you know, both with Dupap, um, but also the question of infallibility, which is linked in effect to, to sovereignty. Um, in, in fact, that that I think that Sch Schmidt is a kind of Demestrian, um, and I think one you know there might be variations of the position, but there but there are there are close things there as well. There's an affinity. 
Also, I think on, on the nat natural law point, I think I, I think that's I think that's also apt. Um, you know, so Schmidt says in his habilitation that his position would be like um, naturrecht ohne natur, uh, natural right or natural law, but without nature. But it's difficult to have a natural right without without nature. Um, and so it's a, right, so it's a non Aristotelian uh, natural right. Maybe it's maybe you could say perhaps, and Schmidt would say something that's an Augustinian view. But also Schmidt thinks, and he thinks that nature can be a constraint upon the power of God, upon the omnipotence of God. But also potentially nature could be a constraint on, on the power of the infallible Pope. Um, and so, the, and, he, and he wouldn't want those constraints. Oh, and then nature could be a constraint on sovereignty uh, as well. And so, in each of those ways, he would not want um, nature as a kind of a uh, side constraint or limit, uh, a limit to power or a limit to authority um, in those ways. And so that, right, it does complicate it. So he doesn't have quite what, what's ca caricatured as the opposite position to uh, positivist uh, view, views of law. Um, Sch Schmitz, Schmitz, not a, Schmitz not a Benthamite, but he's also not an Aristotelian, right? He's not, um, he's not a Finicite, um, but he's also not a Hartian. And so it does actually become difficult to place him then in uh, contemporary legal theoretical debates. Um, but so on, on the question of how does Schmidt then differ from his own time, he does cite uh, contemporary jurisprudence, not a, a lot um, and not always, but more than even the positivists would, which is, and also more than say Kelsen often doesn't cite um, contemporary jurisprudence, right? Kelsen is articulating a doctrinal theory from you know, the, the perspective of, of, the, of the noumenon, uh, right? So, or the noumenal world, a kind of Kantian position. Um, but Schmidt cites more, um, more contemporary jurisprudence, more case law, even though he's not for case law, but he actually, he, but because he thinks, it's it, because it is partially a practice centrist view, he cares about what judges actually do, at least to some extent, right? And to a greater extent, um, than the legal theory of his own time. And if that, that speaks to that. No sé si hay alguna pregunta o algún otro comentario. Eh... So, well, I, I, I can just come up with another question that I have that I had while listening to you um, in your in your introduction. Uh, I, I believe that that's a very important point when approaching a Schmidt and and of course the, the theological force, right? The, the arcanum is always present and it determines the way that he that he intervenes in, in the right in the whole um, genesis of of political modernity in a way. Um, however, I, I, I would like to ask you, do you, do will you also differentiate or um, uh, make a distinction between the sort of theological subst substrate that informs the notion of the political and in that sense, political theology from um, also the theological position, um, which I think that he also, right, uh, that he also contested and, and disputed, especially with, well, not only with, but also with Eric Peterson, um, demonstrating that in a certain way, his theology was, his, th his political theology as the closure of secularization was necessarily always at the level of political theology and in this sense uh getting right getting the the decision power from the old theologians right um uh, yes yeah, so does this fit in the in the framework? yeah no so both both on the peterson issue but also um the question of the of the theological substrate and the theological position in a way, it's at the core of both Schmidt's thought, but also of his life in, in some sense. And going back to your, your prior question about papal infallibility, right? Schmidt's excommunicated. He's excommunicated from for divorce, for uh, extramarital concubinage. In other words, um, living with wife number two, while the church hasn't recognized the end um, of wife of marriage number one, let's say. But Schmidt fights that. Uh, he, he fights that in... Um, in, in ecclesiastical court, and he loses, um, but he doesn't. He doesn't think he should be excommunicated, right? So, 
it's an odd position, but he still defends papal infallibility, right? So he thinks he thinks that there are cases, and he also thinks this about Vatican II. Structurally, he thinks, well, the Pope is infallible, but this is an obvious mistake, right? So the Pope is infallible, but I've been excommunicated. How should one live live that problem? Uh, you know, the Pope is infallible, but Vatican II was a mistake. Uh, the Pope is infallible, but Bellarmine shouldn't have been canonized, which Schmidt actually writes in his notebooks in the 1920s when Bellarmine is canonized. He says, you know, I know that Bellarmine is wrong, but I also know that the Pope is infallible. So how do I live that um, live that issue? And I think that also that haunts um, Schmidt's also relation to uh, the, the Decentrumspartei, the, the Catholic center uh, in, in the Weimar period, um, when being excommunicated and also knocks him out of the of the Catholic Party, where he would have wished, I think, probably to stay and not to have gone to the National Socialists. But once they've excommunicated him, you know, it's part of the background to the um, Führer Schutz das Recht, that it's um, the former heads, the people who had excommunicated, you know, not excommunicated him, but kicked him out of the Catholic Party, whose execution by Hitler he defends, right? So there's, there is a kind of link um, between the issue of his own status in the church um, and his excommunication from the church, which he, which he, I don't think he wished, um, to then his later political stances. Um, but that, so I think that those that that issue between the way in which there is a theological substrate to politics, but also Schmidt's own theological positions, haunts both the thought, um, but I think even more tragically, the life of Schmidt. Which I guess just to just to say something on that line in relation on the biographical register, um, it would seem then that that is why, and this comes clear in the in the diary, right, in glossarium, it it would appear as to why he's also um, uh, he's also a skeptical or shows some kind of um, condescending sort of posture against uh, converts against recent converts of Catholicism. I take it because he would probably think that those are precisely because they're converts, they want to have a more um, militant and doctrinal position, perhaps. But but just as, as, as a question for you then, and also because um, this is a conversation that this year there have been so many um, discussions around Carl Schmitt uh, because of the 100 years of political theology. Um, I think, well, he was here, but I don't think he's here now. Uh, but Professor Guillermo Jensen and, and Andres Rosler from, from Argentina, from the, uh, the law faculty there, um, they, they had a series about uh, Catholic, uh, the Catholic dimension in Schmidt, right? And I wonder what you, uh, what you would say about that beyond the biographical elements. That is, I mean, you mentioned St. Augustine. I, in, in what I've been thinking, I think that that's, um, that's, uh, also something that I've been thinking that is he's closer to the Augustinian tradition than of course the Thomas or St. Saint, Saint Thomas Aquinas, right? The maestre, uh, given that the maestre defended authority over the sort of conciliar conception of the church, right? And so uh, how will you, how will you um, sort of condense uh, the, the complex notion of uh, Schmidt's Catholicism? Right. So he has been also accused of being a, a pagan. Right. This is a Wolfgang Palavers critique uh, that Schmidt is not even a Christian. So I don't know if you have any uh, strong thoughts about this. Yeah, it's, uh, you're, you're going you're going easy on me, uh, Gerardo. So I mean, these are all the the, 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 the soft questions. <laughs> and I mean, is it dangerous because it's being recorded? I mean, so it's a uh, there, you know, there, there are all these there's a in in the mirroring biography of Schmidt. Uh, and Schmidt's um, relation to the Nazi party. Mehring doesn't even decide the question, even in the biography, he kind of lists out, you know, 30 potential reasons um, that Schmidt could have had to join the Nazi party. And, you know, one of them, one of the reasons that he gives um, in that list of 30 things is that Hitler signed the concordance uh, with the church, right? So, so the, um, uh, the concordance treaty, which uh, uh, gives a kind of papal recognition um, to the Nazi government. And it is true that Schmidt only joins the Nazi party afterwards, right? And so that is in the kind of Mehring set of lists. You know, I mean, but Mehring doesn't even decide it. And, you know, and he's he's more than recording. Uh, he's in print on, on that on that issue. But you know, so it's, you've asked me all the soft the soft questions, even while the while the recording is running. 
Uh, but I do think I think you're at, it is apt. I do, so he refers to Augustine as a saint, right? Whereas he um, doesn't refer to Bellarmine as a saint, even though Bellarmine was um, canonized in his lifetime. Um, so uh, Augustinus is is, there, um, is hi, hi, hiding in Augustinus. He gives he gives the saint prefix to Augustine when he refers to him, as he also does to, to Thomas, but more often to Augustine. Um, so. You can also think about Schmidt's ecclesiology is doing a lot of the work, right? So if, if you think about the, the architecture of the book we've been reading for today, the value of the state and significance of the individual, the structure of the book is given in um, the Deubler quote. So Deubler is also a Catholic poet, right? They're also friends. Um, das Nordlicht is a, a poem about um, a kind of, you could say, Catholic cosmology, but also Catholic world history as well. Um, the Deubler quote with which the book opens, the epigraph is, zuerst ist das Gebot, die Menschen kommen später. First is the commandment, the humans come later. And in effect, what you get is you get an account of the law, uh, an account of the state, an account of the, of the individual, and that kind of forms the arc of the book. Um, but the Deubler quote actually structures um, the architecture of the book. You first get an account of law and law, first law and power, but then law, and then the state, and then the individual. Um, and, and law um, is prior to both the state and to, and to the individual. Law has the form of command, and command has the form of commandment. Effectively, the Ten Commandments are the substance of the law, above all, love thy neighbor as thyself, a kind of Pauline uh, core of the law. But Schmidt says, you know, the state has to then implement that. The state is that which realizes law in the world. Uh, the state is the task of the realization of law in the world. And the individual um, is, as it were, that on which the law is inscribed by the state, right? So um, while the law and the state have a high value and a high significance, the individual, in Schmidt's terms, disappears. Um, der Einzelne verschwindet. It, it um, dissolves and disappears. Um, so you have both, it's both the architecture of the book, but also kind of hierarchy, law above state, state above individual, um, that's given by the Dorbler quote. And that, so there's some element, both bi biographic, but also a line of affinity to the Catholic poet Deubler um, in the architecture of the text. But also you can think, of, think about Schmidt's ecclesiology as structuring his state theory. And he says in the, in the chapter on the state, but also in the chapter on the individual, Catholic, Catholic doctrine, above all the doctrine of papal infallibility, um, is the best version of state theory. Um, and if you wanted to see the best account of what a state is, um, the Vatican and, and the papal states give the best picture of that. Bueno, no sé si hay alguna, alguna intervención o comentario de alguien eh, como para no seguir. Eh. Sí, sí, Gerardo. Uh, well, thank you so much for your presentation and, and for this very rich dialogue. I'm, I'm coming to this exchange um, from the, the cold outside, so, so I want to introduce a, a slightly, um, like a slight change of, of, of rhythm here. I'm, I'm curious to ask you, um, on the basis of, of your wide knowledge and, and all of your work, what, what your appraisal is with regard to current scholarship and debates um, around Schmidt. Um, in particular, I am interested in your sense of aspects or um, questions that are less often addressed that might be um, sort of um, interesting to promote work on um, and, and how that stands in the wider sort of political philosophical horizons, um, you know, in, in the way that you, that you yourself perceive them um, these days. That's a, so it's a great, a great question. So both, both a, an appraisal of, um, yeah, the state of the literature, let's say, but also um, things that are less addressed. So, for example, Gerardo's last good point about Augustine, I think, is a fruitful line of research, right? So, what's Schmidt's view? How does Schmidt read um, the City of God? Um, how does he read uh, that book? 
And how does he? How does that book relate to his own uh, state theory? You know, also, you know, how can can we think of um, following Gerardo? Can we think of Schmidt between Demestre and Augustine, for example? But I also think um, the the line of questioning on positivism you know, that that open that opens a series of of paths. You know, what what are actually the alternatives to po positivism, or have we have we actually in the light of a predominantly Anglo American paradigm, you know, a kind of Hart versus uh, Finnis, a kind of Oxonian paradigm. We've internalized the Oxford's sovereignty over our souls. Um, you, know, you know, to what extent, and that's just actually one Oxford college of, of the 40 of them, just in university college, just uh, Hart, uh, H.L. Hart and uh, Finnis. Is that, does that exhaust um, the possibilities of legal theoretical and legal philosophic debate? Uh, but are, are there actually, you know, quasi, as it were, quasi natural law positions that don't line up fully with where, where Finnis or where others are? But also something like, how should we think about even Nazi ideology, right? For example, and this goes back to also Gerardo's point, but some of the other questions as well. You know, should we think about, you know, if we, if, we if we read a textbook on Nazi ideology, for example, we'll often read that the Nazis were all Darwinists, for example. Now, Schmidt, Schmidt Darwinist for Schmidt is a kind of um, insult term. You know, he, he's not, you know, he he makes fun of, uh, and he even uses ev evolutionist as a kind of pejorative term. Um, but if you, if you situated him and his legal thought within the frame of Nazi ideology, um, as one, you know, especially during from 33 to 45, it would be reasonable to do so. How should we think about that? You know, do, do we do we then see a, a fuller picture of actually theolo Nazi theological positions in addition to um, Nazi scientific positions that often use of Nazi ideology to pin Nazism on Darwin. I think Schmidt would force us to rethink that. I mean, these, these, these would all be, I think, paths of research that we could follow that would open up new horizons, both for thinking about Schmidt, um, for thinking about legal philosophy, uh, for thinking about Catholic political thought and Catholic theology, but also how do we think about the legacies of National Socialism and of National Socialist ideology, which is all too, uh, all too present in the world today. Um, those those maybe be some some paths. I don't know. Do you have a follow up or other questions? It was a, it was a great question. Well, in relation to this, um, would you say then that perhaps, um, and 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 this perhaps relates also to the to the first question about realism in Schmidt, right? I think that a certain conception, I fully agree with you, a certain conception of realism is understood as um, taking advantage or, or a, precisely the instrumentalization of values in jurisprudence. Whereas it seems that, it seems to me that, especially reading uh, um, a, a series of uh, works of Schmidt uh, for a little bit of time, it seems that he's very interested too in, in um, how a, a how a genesis of political organization, right? How a concrete order is established, and and if that's the case, then uh, sometimes positivism, pure positivism, cannot deal with um, with real threats, right? Uh, and so it seems to me that that's why Schmidt sometimes, when uh, the when the crisis cannot be confronted through through just pure pure law or pure legality, right? Uh, the decision intervenes, right? But at the same time, on the contrary, uh, once national socialism takes power, I think we see also a clear uh, in pro-institutionalist, right? Position of Schmidt, uh, not favoring just uh, decision on the exception or for a long time, but rather uh, institutional, um, uh, safeguards and uh, judicial control, right? A friend, uh, appealing to French legists, right, uh, etc. Um, and, and I think that's very useful today because that that means that perhaps in Schmidt there is not a a circumscribed and closed theory, right? But it's rather a theory of seeing where the weaknesses, right? That for instance, this Wednesday a big case in the United States Supreme Court is happening. Which is called the Independent State Legislature, um, which, uh, again, in in the name of interpretation, in the name of legal interpretation, um, the the power of legislature is going to be uh, assumed as having no 
uh, as having full autonomy and, and no controls based on state constitutions or even uh, a state Supreme Court. I mean, this is a, a question of federalism, but I think that a Schmidt and a Schmidt, a Schmidtian comprehension would, would say, well, as much as I, in the theory of constitution, understand constituent power and democratic rule, as you said at the beginning, um, to have full autonomy of legislature on the loose like this is a threat, right? Um, so I guess my question is this, right? Is Smith at the end of the day just a, a thinker of threats of legality? Yeah, no, there's, there's a lot. So, so to the end, the end point. I mean, it was a kind of it was a rich, a rich series of thoughts. Um, is Schmidt just a thinker of threats to legality? Of of is it threats to legality or threats of legality? Yeah, perhaps both. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, so right. So I mean, as, as you know, and as you probably have been talking about in this course, right, Schmidt you know, it's well known, has a distinction between legality and legitimacy. Um, but that's actually thoroughgoing. And, and you actually see it in the early legal theoretical works. And he's playing off the Latin, right? So there's use and lex, a kind of rightness and mere statute, mere law, right? And, and that corresponds to legitimacy to use and legality to lex. Um, and in the early legal theoretical writings, that the, sh the shape of that is recht, um, as the rightness corresponding to use and um, gazettes corresponding to lex. Uh, so it, it, that's a kind of, and then I think that that, that persists throughout Schmidt's work, even, even uh, on TV democracy, a very late text as uh, Herardo rightly noted, collected in the uh, tyranny of values and other texts. Schmidt runs this, um, this paradigm, the use, lex, rect, gazettes paradigm. And you can also think about, even if it's not natural law, it is some kind of higher law um, that you can appeal to, you know, rightness or legitimacy appeals to a higher law, whether that's use divinum, which Schmidt said is a true, uh, a true use, a true rect is use divinum, and that any mere statute, um, any mere um, paper parchment text um, should always, you know, be assessed in light of this higher um, divine law or rect or use. So, so I think that, that it is, I think right, um, as, as Gerardo points out, to think about Schmidt as, as perceiving any lex um, that is merely and only lex as potentially threatening. But there also, there, you know, there also is, is some notion of agreement um, which, which the community has that is beyond that. Um, and and secures me. We agree as a community that green means go, for example. And um, it's it's arbitrary that we you know agree that. Um, I, I hear outside my house door in England, I hear um, parents telling their their children, wait, wait for the green man, you know, wait, and then go, you know, then cross cross the street, right? So but but then actually they're they're teaching them. And it's, so it's a kind of it's a kind of pedagogic component. There's an element of the of the practice that actually shapes the cultural background of the law. Um, if you are waiting for um, for the for the green person to cross the street, but there was also this is kind of huge and rich. So there, I think that so the, the short answer to Herardo's question is yes, but there's so, so much going on there. So there's a question about um, the instrumental instrumentalization of values for jurisprudence. There was an issue about Schmidt's realism. Um, something about the genesis of institutions and the concrete order. I think so, just to draw, draw out one thread on the realism question is Schmidt. You know, we, there's some sense in which we, we, you know he might. Um, contest the notion of the real, um, and we might think about realism as a contested concept, but there's also some sense which, even if Schmidt is to be thought of as some kind of realist, that realism is not um, to be separated from symbolism, right? So it's not to be separate, separated from iconography, from images, um, including things like traffic lights, um, but where everyone shares in the image. And that also, you know, for his the, the theological substrate, but also for the theological position, that sh that is also for him partially a Christian background or especially a, a Catholic Christian background. Um, and that's not to be ignored. So something like Christian symbolism and Christian iconography, I think for Schmidt can't be divorced from Schmidt's um, legal thought, realist or otherwise. And I do think also that symbolism and images and even pre-rational notions um, are part of what ground any concrete order. 
And I think that that might be a kind of link, you could say, between Schmidt and Augustine rather than Schmidt and Aquinas, is that ultimately Schmidt is not a rationalist, and that pre-rational, affective, and also imagistic notions um, structure, shape, um, and frame political community. Would you say that this image or um, notion that you refer to also has to do with, with the word, with the concept that he, through which he defines sometimes the enemy too, the, the, which is double too, right? Uh, gestalt, right? Oh, great, great. So, right. So, as uh, one of Schmidt's favorite lines from 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 this poet, uh, whom Gerardo rightly mentions, is that um, the, the enemy is one's own question as a figure, right? As a as a Gestalt um, defined as is unsere eigene Frage als Gestalt, and I think that that is also that that puts us actually, you know, also a, um, a line of sight with with the enemy. We are in some sense on a planar on a planar equality with the enemy. We look the enemy in the eye even if it's um, across a front or across a battlefield, um, we have also um, a kind of self-relation to, um, to the enemy as we also have a kind of self-relation to the friend, right? The friend in Aristotle's sense is another myself. Um, the friend defined by Schmidt um, in the late text um, on the TV democracy, Schmidt says the, the friend is um, the most intense relation of affiliation or identification. And it also the enemy is the most intense relation of annihilation, um, but that which puts me in question, but that which I also want to put in question. Um, so it is, um, we are framed by these images and the images define who we are. Which, which I guess it also, um, it also speaks to 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 Carl Schmitt's um, very rooted, right? This is this will also be a difference with the theologians, I think, right? I mean, if theology is understood as as a strong anti-modern force, only only in that extent, um, but a Schmitt's uh, modern uh, sort of root has to do with this sort of uh, dialectic, right, between the image and and the modern epoch a sort of an epoch of, well, in the Heideggerian sense, right? Uh, as the epoch of, of a world picture or the age of picture or the gestell, right? And so in a way, right, um, uh, the, the, the image in which we have to answer to all, is always walking with or along uh, nihilism. I think that's so also right. So also Schmidt is interested, right? He's precisely interested in, you know, in a picture of the world, also pictures of the globe. Um, he wants to think about the world in which we're living in this true and nomos of the earth, but also in the late cover of land and sea, the cover image is, is a globe. Um, and so, so the, to think the globe, um, but also to think as it were from his perspective, global civil war um, or the worldwide civil war, Schmidt is 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 thinking both in and with those images and also also through. Um, the image, um, and, and there is some sense in which the image is prior and precedes the thought. This has been great. Uh, I can continue, but I think we are we're running out of time, and I don't want to abuse anyone's generosity here with the time. So I don't know if there's any one last question in this last uh, two minutes or so, or algún comentario o pregunta ante que ante que cerremos. Well, just just one uh, biographical question. Uh, uh, do you plan? Uh, are there any plans of uh, other other new translations or editions of Schmidt's uh, work in the in the makings? We're working on um, so con text contemporary with the one that you introduced um, very generously and kindly uh, today. Um, so Schmidt's early essays on Schopenhauer, Kant, um, juristic fictions, the state of siege. Um, the texts which are contemporary with these texts, but shorter texts, um, collected with um, some works from scholars, both from, from Italy, but from all over Europe, uh, also with uh, Reinhard Mehring, um, with Carlo Galli, um, Andrea Salvatore, Mariano Croce, so some commentary on Schmidt's early um, legal writings, 
um, coupled with some of these shorter um, legal theoretical, but also philosophic texts. Um, but also, I just, I just want to say um, thank you both um, to Gerardo Munoz and also um, to the whole of the Institute of Critical Studies uh, for the great chance to talk with you today. I see that there is a, a further um, question, which I'd happily answer, I guess. Um, in your introduction, you speak of the young Schmidt. Do you think that only the young Schmidt was the one who devoted himself to studying the phenomenon of law? Uh, and after that, his study on the faith field dominated the political. But I think also for Schmidt, I mean, partially because, because the law, insofar as it's a practice, um, isn't framed by what people all agree on. If you have um, a community of faith, that's going to shape um, the, community, the community of law, but also the community of legal practice, let's say. And Schmidt probably couldn't have, um, you know, Schmidt, he passes his dissertation in Strasbourg. He's not defending uh, his either his dissertation or his habilitation in Berlin. Um, he's defending it in you know the then you know more more Catholic Alsace, um, but also German Catholic Alsace. So, but he's not. Um, so there is some some kind of background of faith. He also shares um, a Catholic at least confessional confessional faith with his um, doctoral supervisor von Kalka. Um, so there is some there's some affiliation there. And I do think that even in the habilitation, it's kind of it's kind of audacious, right? He opens his habilitation, which is an official document with chicken and egg jokes. He says, you know, which comes first, you know, the chicken or the egg, the state or the individual, the law or the state, right? I would, I mean, I would be afraid even at Berkeley to, you know, open my dissertation uh, with the chicken and the egg joke, you know. But Schmidt's doing it, right? In in high Wilhelmine Germany, it's a kind of mockery of of the exercise of. Um, you know, writing multiple, you know, qualification writings. Um, and it's a pretty audacious and also funny thing to do. So there is some sense in which obviously the prose of the habilitation and the dissertation is, is, is almost Proustian and doesn't look like the Schmidt that we know, right? The Schmidt of the laser sentence, these fine aphorisms. But the spirit of mockery and the aphoristic jabbing is there amidst the kind of serpentine sentences on the law. Well, that, that that's funny. I didn't know about that, but now, um, uh, now I see that even even in the jokes, the influence of a Schmidt continues because um, I don't know if you know, but uh, uh, Scott Shapiro's right, the the great uh, positivist from Yale Law School, has uh, chicken and the egg too in his great book in in legality, right? Um, so so that that has a continuation, it seems, right? So um, I think it's a good. This is a great, um, uh, a great instance just to to leave it here, and of course to to thank you so much, Sam, for taking the time and giving us all this all this great uh, um, uh, nuance and original take that you have on Schmidt, and of course we'll we'll be uh, waiting for your other editions to drop. So yeah. I thank you, and of course I thank uh, Instituto de Cicietes and everyone who participated in the seminar, right, that allow us to to have this opportunity. Yeah, so. thank, thank you. Thank you. And thank you to the Institute and um, muchas gracias. Yeah. On the contrary, thank you. And thank you both. And thanks to the group as well.